Hey everybody, I'm Patrick Ellis. I am the CTO at SnapR. And just to give a little bit of context, we're a uh, early stage team. We're about eight people, 13-ish if you include contractors. And uh, we're really trying to go for the highly leveraged using Gen AI throughout the entire company uh, uh, meme that I'm sure everybody's seen on uh, online. So uh, there's a lot of applied learnings that I thought could be pretty interesting to share. A quick background, I've spent time in uh, SF in uh, Seattle over the last 10 years as a full stack engineer and then been really diving deep the last uh, I would say year and a half to a year on the code gen side, and then kind of the last almost two years on the, uh, we, we've had a Gen AI based uh, product in production, uh, mostly on the multimodal side, so uh, Stable Diffusion, uh, Flux, you know, uh, that toolkit. Um, and then of course a lot of reasoning uh, now as well. So I've been uh, trying to go as deep as I can. Uh, I was just at the uh, AI Engineer Summit in New York uh, a couple weeks ago, and that was super helpful. A lot of lessons uh, and learnings from other attendees. Okay, so where has vibe coding really helped? The first area is more of what I would actually consider vibe coding for us. So for our workflow, that tends to include using bolt.new or lovable.dev. Um, I'm sure most of you, actually, who is familiar with uh, bolt or lovable? Okay, yeah, so basically everybody. Um, so of course, you know, kind of a zero to one or greenfield, uh, you know, new code base development. Um, and then eventually taking that over with Cursor or Windsurf, or I've actually been using Claude Code uh, the most uh, as of late. I, I feel like it's been the most competent for our uh, use cases. So what's been really interesting with that is empowering the non-technical folks. Uh, so even our product folks, but um, our sales, uh, even our CEO, um, being able to allow them to prototype and explore ideas and then uh, uh, taking that over on the engineering side. Sometimes that means actually, uh, uh, like with a more ephemeral, uh, less um, durable, or kind of a, um, something that we're gonna uh, maintain long term, something that's like a, like a gallery or a slideshow in our context, um, can be excellent to use that workflow for, where we build it with Cursor or Lovable, and then like get it to uh, integrate with our backend and everything using Cursor or Windsurf. For anything more complex, of course, that uh, doesn't necessarily work, but what is really valuable is using bolt.new and lovable to essentially uh, communicate effectively from the non-technical folks to engineering what the requirements are. So you can think of it as like Figma plus you know, uh, a bunch of you know, uh, uh, requirements, uh, documentations, and then actual like, uh, feedback with an engineer. So instead of me working with our uh, yeah, uh, CPO, for example, um, he can go and just kind of iterate with uh, essentially an engineer, um, a Bolt or Lovable, to kind of get a sense of what capabilities are there. I mean, especially for somebody non-technical, that's been a huge, huge help for a lot of basic stuff that an engineer would help with. So being able to uh, define the ideas more concretely um, and then either you know, fully transfer those over or even using one of the models, so you know, Claude or whatever, to describe in great detail the requirements uh, from that new code base into like a markdown doc, which we can then use as a uh, uh, starter to apply a more disciplined engineering process uh, using Claude code, for example, in order to build that up to an actual production application. Uh, so that idea of using these models to create the code and then describe it, which is like a lower fidelity way to represent all the features and ideas, and then to rebuild that using, again, a more disciplined workflow uh, has been really, really valuable. So yeah, the non-engineering, engineering requirements and capabilities communication, as I just described. Um, honestly, it's been uh, this workflow using Bolt and uh, Lovable has been able to replace Figma for a lot of uh, our apps. And again, keep in mind, we're earlier stage, so um, uh, there's a lot of new development and uh, new features that are actually a really, really good fit uh, for this workflow. Uh, of course, Figma is still important for more mature uh, versions of our products. And then uh, getting partner feedback, customer dev, you know, being able to like spin something up and show a salesperson, um, and then the uh, development speed up. Um, so yes, a slideshow, uh, we went from Bolt to Cursor, and that is uh, entering production this week. Um, that was almost entirely vibe coded. Obviously, I've you know, uh, reviewed the PRs and uh, made sure that we're not uh, doing anything crazy, um, but it's a, fairly, or it's a very simple code base. And then something more complicated like uh, a new dashboard that we're building uh, right now, that is something where the, the second approach I mentioned where we're exploring ideas um, has, has been uh, much more helpful. So um, that's the first step is kind of the vibe coding side. Another piece that has been really valuable to us has been augmenting uh, uh, our traditional development workflows using Claude. Um, 
so I, I just described this quite a bit. Um, uh, I think the difference here, though, in the more kind of disciplined approach, as I mentioned, is really treating the models as a pair programmer or a thinking partner. Or oh, uh, a funny way I kind of like to uh, think of this is, uh, I'm sure you guys have all read or heard of you know, the pragmatic programmer and like the, the rubber ducky uh, on your desk, right? Something that you can like kind of get out of your head and talk to, even if it's an inanimate. But it's kind of interesting that now we have actual things that we can talk to um, and to iterate, you know, to kind of stay in flow, but to have actual feedback and insights uh, coming from that. So this, uh, I, I think the Claude code docs do a great job of kind of concretely illustrating what this process can look like of having a more disciplined, iterative approach. So I would refer to those for, uh, again, what's worked well for us. But that um, paraprogramming approach, you can get real production grade, I think scalable um, uh, code bases out of that because you're, of course, intentionally thinking through what's happening. You're code reviewing, you're uh, iterating and involved with the design process. But it's still a huge, huge multiplier of productivity, at least in our context. So again, not vibe coding. It's, it's a, it's, I consider that more traditional vibe coding, or a, a traditional coding, but with uh, the discipline of the traditional software engineering uh, workflow. That said, though, everything I'm doing now is like almost completely different than it was two months ago in terms of my own process using a bunch of these tools. And then, um, yeah, uh, aiding and audit, uh, like automating solutions engineering and enterprise customizations. I think this is a pretty interesting one. I don't know, I haven't heard anybody talking about it. I'm sure people are thinking about it though. So for our use case, uh, we almost have like a new business model that's come out over the last year. And it's uh, a productized service at greater scale. So if you think of the amount of value that you can unlock as you push a little bit more into the agency side of operating, uh, so you know, big enterprise clients uh, with more traditional solutions engineering, um, customized almost like agency work. Uh, so. I didn't mention this, but Snapbar, we're uh, in a, like event marketing platform, so we have a suite of AI tools that help uh, uh, marketers um, in different contexts. So for them, having customization of the microsite, for example, that they have at some, some large uh, uh, product release or whatever is really helpful. Um, so by uh, s pushing a little bit more into the service side, having more of what I would call traditionally a productized service, we're able to capture a lot more value um, uh, in, uh, for our customers and provide a lot more value. But then we're also able to uh, heavily automate that or aid it uh, with you know, these uh, code gen tools. And then sometimes uh, what we're pushing towards is fully automating it. So you can imagine, again, making a bunch of like front-end customizations uh, that the end customer is uh, prompting an agent to do. Or right now what that looks like is our solutions engineer uh, uh, operations folks using these uh, code gen tools like Cursor and uh, Windsurf in order to get that last mile. So I think these second and third order impacts, such as this uh, business model, are, are pretty interesting to think through. Um, and then, uh, we, uh, this was touched on a little bit, but the st strategy and marketing product research side of things. Uh, so yeah, deep research, I mean, it's using O3 under the hood. So if you can get past the like, deep uh, research side of things, you've got literally the most powerful model that OpenAI has right now to help you uh, think through uh, coding challenges, and it, and it shows. Um, I th for us too, though, uh, you know, deep market research, uh, company strategy, uh, product strategy, feeding as much into it as we can, uh, giving it enough context to really help us think through our ideas, whether that's product or, again, business strategy, market research, thinking through new releases, um, anything like that. One other uh, tactical piece that we found was really helpful is uh, taking transcriptions, uh, this was just alluded to a bit, uh, from our meetings and then feeding them into Notebook LM to use either the podcast feature, which is incredible if you guys haven't used that, or uh, you know, just being able to interact with it and ask specific questions. But you can take that summary and then feed that into Claude, for example, to create like a PRD.MD uh, or like a other markup that can uh, be helpful. All right, so um, again, there's, there's uh, no chance I'm gonna finish through all these slides. Uh, so I'll, I'll show the uh, QR code at the end here. And, but I've got a list of a bunch of specific workflows and tools. Um, one thing I uh, wanted to cover here though, so uh, traditional AI models that you, Guys are all, I'm sure, uh, familiar with here that have been really helpful. So of course, Claude 3.7 has been great, although it's a little ambitious for code gen and architecture. Um, O1 Pro and O3 Mini, high for thinking through uh, uh, architectural approaches. And then deep research for uh, quickly learning about a new domain. Uh, and then also helping uh, get spun up on libraries, uh, tools, um, doing strategic research, anything like that. 
And then, of course, the code gen tools, uh, Cursor, Windsurf, Claude Code for development, and then Bolt and Lovable for uh, new prototypes. Um, and then what I found to be the most helpful MCP servers uh, have been the, uh, um, uh, well, there's the MCP directory, and that's from the official, like, uh, you know, people behind the spec uh, that Anthropic's been working with. Um, so that's a great, uh, that GitHub repo has a bunch of resources. And then browser tools basically gives context uh, to uh, Claude or, you know, uh, wherever you're using your MCP cursor uh, to your browser, uh, like network logs, uh, you know, console logs, and then it can take screenshots, which is really helpful. And as was mentioned earlier, too, just keeping it in context and allowing it to, uh, like the agent, to have as much context as possible um, uh, in its uh, session is super helpful and just allowing us to stay in flow as we're developing. Um, and then uh, Firecrawl for turning any website into Markdown. That way these models don't have to parse a bunch of you know, XML or HTML and a bunch of it distracting documents but can get right to the concise um, uh, context that is needed is super helpful. I've also found personally that uh, at least with Cursor, I, um, Windsurf and uh, uh, Cloud Code as well, I don't feel like they do a great job of indexing docs uh, so being able to actually pull whatever I'm working with a bunch and then shove that into uh, a markdown file has been really helpful. And just to give some context here, uh, skipping over the cursor rules since that was covered pretty well, um, uh, the, uh, what I'll do is I'll create a, I think I've got this here, uh, a context file um, and, or a, a like folder in my repo. You don't have to, but just to keep things organized. And then I'll create a docs file and then throw any documentation that I'm working with. External, like I just mentioned, uh, using uh, Firecrawl MCP to go out and programmatically grab stuff or just using Firecrawl directly and then uh, putting those markdown files in the docs. And then also um, we had, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, 80 pages of uh, API documentation for one of our services in Google Docs. So I just uh, saved that, or you can export it as a markdown file and then brought that directly into uh, this, this folder as well, which can be a little heavy on the context, but, you know, it was super helpful for us. Um, so, uh, and then uh, a couple other tools, you know, the Google Docs piece I just mentioned, then of course Super Whisper, if you guys are familiar, shout out to Art for uh, uh, giving me a bunch of tool recommendations, including this one. Uh, but that's to get the you know, true vibe coding, being able to uh, like hit a hot key and then have uh, a model transcribe your uh, speech. And then it's context aware. So it knows, is it uh, in a you know, cursor uh, terminal? Is it uh, in a, like a text a message thread? Is it in an email context? So it can um, clean up your text or, or not clean up your text depending on the use case, which is just so helpful for that uh, rapid iteration. Uh, how am I doing on time, Tyler? Five minutes. Five minutes? OK. Um, all right, so I just wanted to cover so I've got um, some strategy and helpful patterns and then uh, some workflow tips here. I'm just kind of giving you guys, uh, so this is like the exact workflow I'll use, um, including the context that I'll generate, you know, PRD docs, that kind of stuff. And then a bunch of educational resources here. Um, one thing I'll touch on, I think because the space is moving so incredibly fast, uh, I mean, it's just wild, as everybody knows. I mean, each week there's, there's new stuff for us to, to dive deep into. Having good sources of knowledge and being able to uh, really efficiently uh, filter through the noise and find the signal is so important. So I just want to highlight these and I'll go back to the strategy bit. Uh, anything late in space, they're the people, uh, Swix and, and uh, a few others behind uh, AI Engineer World's Fair, um, which I found tons of value for from. Their uh, podcast, the Latent Space podcast here, and then their uh, website, which is just uh, latent.space, I believe, yeah, at the top there. Uh, those are two excellent, excellent resources. Uh, they've got like a uh, 2024, uh, or like in a 2024 AI engineers uh, white paper, like the must read white papers across a bunch of different domains. They're a little bit more focused on true AI engineering, so like applied AI and ML, or you know, using LLMs and, and reasoning within your apps, but uh, super helpful for the vibe coding side of things as well. Um, Anyway, some, some great, uh, uh, you know, anything Carpathy, uh, uh, the uh, FASA AI for more ML uh, resources, um, a bunch of great conferences, including, of course, Joe's AI Tinkerers, which is incredible. Um, and then some great YouTube channels. I'll just highlight AI Explained really quick. Uh, he does an amazing job of covering new white papers, uh, new um, uh, advancements or like releases coming out from any of the Frontier Labs. Would highly, highly recommend giving them a follow. Um, and then, of course, the AI engineer, uh, uh, the conference, they have a bunch of their YouTube videos brought over there. Um, so um, here's the uh, QR code to those, uh, just to highlight that um, if you wanted. A couple uh, pieces of strategy uh, that I just wanted to, to touch on in my last couple minutes here. I think 
the biggest thing I've, I've found using all this is that context really, really matters. Um, so what, are, like the way I like to think about it is, I mean, if you were the model and like having empathy for the model, if you were only told what what's the model has access to, so like what's in the context, uh, what's indexed in the code base, uh, what MCPs it has access to, it could go out and grab, what's in your context folder uh, and you know like the API docs and everything. I mean, that's all it knows. And if you think about this is a great reason to go out and, and, and learn more of the fundamentals of how these LLMs work. But if you understand their architecture and if you understand what they were trained on, uh, and, and kind of this like uh, this fuzzy, um, you know, long-term memory, if you will, to draw an analogy to us, there's only so much that they can pull from. Uh, so one, being able to really highlight things that you want it to help you with. So giving concrete examples, pulling in these precise docs. Uh, making sure that you reference uh, the, the thread that you had above so that the model really does you know, anchor to that part of the neural net um, and you know, be able to like, fire from its most competent uh, uh, yeah, weights. Um, uh, doing all that is so helpful. So just thinking really concretely about your context and what you're asking it to do uh, and being you know, uh, articulate and, and, and concrete in your thoughts is, is really important. So vibe coding, of course, is fun from like uh, using Super Whisper and running quickly. But if you really want to get great results out of these models, and they're, in, or they're capable of incredible things in my uh, experience if you do, uh, writing well and, and, and treating it like a true pair programmer or another person on the team is, is, is very critical. So that's, that's probably the most valuable, uh, the context is everything piece here. Um, and then, yeah, defining your con, your uh, stack up front. So, like, what tooling? Uh, again, this was covered really well earlier. Uh, you're using is is so valuable. That way, you're anchoring, especially with Bolt or um, Lovable, you're anchoring the output to what your code base actually is. Um, this has been helpful for us on the non-technical side. Uh, you know, making sure that those folks are aligned with our code base. Um, and then, of course, choosing libraries and frameworks that have a ton of training data. Uh, so you know, type, anything TypeScript, React, Next.js, uh, Node tends to have a you know, ton of open source examples. Um, and then a lot of these libraries are more modern tech stacks too. I feel like the, the training data or the quality of the apps that they're pulling from are, are really high end. So unfortunately due to time, this is the last thing I'll say. Um, what's been great is these are really good at uh, UI design and um, like a bunch of, or like, like even SEO. Being able to just like quickly get a suggestion, if you will, going into your app and just asking it for ways to improve SEO. Um, uh, and, you know, again, same thing with design as was brought up earlier. And I think part of it is the training data plus the prompting, being able to pull from really well-established uh, code bases um, and like great uh, paradigms. So for our team, especially the non-technical team, but you know, like for me as well, I'm starting projects out not from just my own understanding, but pulling from some of these you know great patterns in modern code bases, uh, you know style uh, guidelines, frameworks, and then I'm starting there versus just what I would come up with on my own. So I think by using these tools, we're able to aggregate a bunch of knowledge and really have a boost to uh, uh, to what the end product is because we're iterating on you know an 80 percent baseline versus a 50 percent baseline if you want to think about it that way. Anyways, thanks for your time. Exactly 20 minutes, but if you want to take like one question before we wrap up, anyone, anyone want to ask that a question? Yeah. When you're doing uh, enterprise sort of customization of your application, but like letting the customer, let's say, fiddle around with the UI, are you like tenant facing that, or are you just saying, like, go ahead and modify the UI any way that you want, and we'll just deal with the consequences for everybody else? Great question. So, uh, uh, our workflow for a lot of the customizations is actually uh, a, a Git-based workflow. Actually, this might be kind of interesting to folks. Uh, so we use Netlify for a lot of, uh, to provision a lot of our front ends or uh, host them. Uh, so we actually will just uh, provision a branch. Uh, so all the logic is the same as our core branch, and then it's really easy for us to obviously make that change, and then just assign them a subdomain, uh, and then uh, that completely isolates any changes unique to that client. Um, uh, on the back end, we have a, it's a little bit more complicated, but most of our, our changes for enterprise uh, are on the front end, and we use uh, 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 Node.js functions quite a bit in order to uh, get around any uh, seeking points that that might bring up. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks.